The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells Book 1 The Coming of the Martians Chapter 1 No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's and yet as mortal as his own. As men busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinised and studied, perhaps as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinise the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. Slowly and surely they drew their plans against us. We might have seen the danger to us much earlier. We did not understand that for countless centuries Mars had been in a state of war. Scientists watched the red planet but failed to interpret what they observed. Meanwhile, the Martians were preparing their invasion. In 1894, a great light was seen at the Lick Observatory. Then an astronomer on Java saw what he called a jet of fire on the planet. It started around midnight and disappeared 15 minutes later. This mass of flaming gas was moving with an enormous velocity towards this Earth. The astronomer compared the flame to gases fired from a gun. The next day there was nothing of this in the papers except a little note in the Daily Telegraph. The world was ignoring one of the gravest dangers that ever threatened the human race. I only heard about the explosion when I met Ogilvy, the well-known astronomer, at Ottershaw. He was so excited at the news from Java that he invited me up to join him in observing the red planet that night. In spite of all that has happened since, I still remember that vigil very distinctly. I remember the black and silent observatory, the shadowed lantern in the corner, the steady ticking of the clockwork of the telescope, the little slit in the roof. Looking through the telescope, I watched the planet. It was more than 40 million miles from us. 40 million miles of empty space. Across that incredible distance, drawing nearer every minute by so many thousands of miles, came the thing they were sending us. The thing that was to bring so much struggle and calamity and death to the earth. I never dreamed of it then as I watched. No one on earth dreamed of that unerring missile. That night, too, there was another jetting out of gas. I saw the reddish flash just as the chronometer struck midnight. I told Ogilvy and he took my place. He watched till one, and then we lit the lantern and walked over to his house. Down below in the darkness were Ottershaw and Chertsey, and all their hundreds of people sleeping in peace. Ogilvy thought that the meteorites might be falling in a heavy shower upon the planet, or that a huge volcanic explosion was in progress. He pointed out to me how unlikely it was that life had evolved in the same direction in the two adjacent planets. The chances against anything manlike on Mars are a million to one, he said. Hundreds of observers saw the flame that night, and again the night after, and so for ten nights, a flame each night. Even the daily papers finally began taking notice of the disturbances. Nobody suspected the Martians had fired missiles at us, and these were now hurtling towards us through the empty gulf of space. Hour by hour and day by day, they came nearer and nearer. It seems to me now wonderful that men could go about their petty concerns as they did. 
For my own part, I was much occupied in learning to ride the bicycle. One warm, starlit night, I went for a walk with my wife. I pointed out Mars, a bright dot of light towards which so many telescopes were pointing. Coming home, a party of excursionists from Chertsey or Isleworth passed us singing and playing music. There were lights in the upper windows of the houses as the people went to bed. From the railway station in the distance came the sound of shunting trains, ringing and rumbling, softened almost into melody by the distance. My wife pointed out to me the brightness of the red, green and yellow signal lights hanging in a framework against the sky. It seemed so safe and tranquil.